Hey guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we get the folks who, let's face it, are the most interesting and focused on the future. Today, we've got somebody doing that with three names, Paul Root Wolp on the program. Thanks for coming today, Paul. Sure, my pleasure. So Paul, there's a lot of different ways we could start this interview, but I wanted to ask, what sci-fi work has most influenced your thoughts and do you think we're headed towards? Because I feel like you've considered a lot of the possibilities. Boy, it's hard to say, first of all, what has influenced me the most, because I read a lot of science fiction as a kid and, and um, you know, the classics foundation trilogy and, uh, you know, Paul Anderson. I mean, I could go through Ray Bradbury. I could go through all the classics and say each one had a contribution to my way of thinking. So um, it's the genre that's influenced me more than any individual work. And I find even short stories that I read, even ones that aren't very well known, uh, bubbling up at times in my thinking uh, as I go through time. But one of the things, interestingly, I, I often tell my students about science fiction is what's so fascinating about the science fiction of my youth is that it's all come true. With the possible exception of the whole genre about aliens coming down to Earth, um, with that exception, almost every... Um, meaningful science fiction story in one way or another that was about the possible directions humans can go and and the advent of robots and of cyborgs and of, of all of that or of kind of the 1984 dystopian science fiction. I mean, in one way or another, you can find all of those uh, happening in our society at some level um, or grains of all of those and in that sense, science fiction and reality have really merged in a way that few other genres of fiction have. Which makes you wonder, what's the science fiction of tomorrow bring? Exactly. And, you know, what does it look like when we live in a science fiction world? Um, how do you imagine futures that are the next step in science fiction and that say something new and fresh about the human um, interaction with uh, the digital world or the AI world or the next generation of technologies that will impact humanity. Speaking of, I've heard you say Kurzweil is wrong about the singularity. Curious to hear why and then to elaborate a bit. Yeah, um, I'm a sociologist and my training is in, organization, in, in social dynamics and the way societies evolve. And I think there is a kind of, we like to look back in the past and, and, and laugh a little bit um, uh, in, in a way that I think is a little bit condescending to the predictions of the past, none of which seem to have come true. The people who said, you know, we only have a need for uh, 10 personal computers or whatever the head of IBM said in that famous quote. Um, but we're a lot less critical of predictions we make today as they project in the future. And the reason that predictions are so bad, thinking 10, 20 years down the line or more, is that social dynamics are extraordinarily complex. And social dynamics disrupt predictions all the time. And so there's a certain symmetry and, and simplicity that makes Kurzweil's prediction beautiful and seems to make some intuitive sense to us. While at the same time, I think social dynamics are going to take us in all kinds of directions that we're not yet anticipating. And the internal dynamics of um, science and science progress are going to you know, take a left turn at some point and, and create something new that makes this idea of, of like perfect convergence or um, uh, seem naive. So it isn't so much that I think he's profoundly wrong. I just think that we're going to find that, that um, real life tends to have a disruptive effect on our predictions and that it's really tough to know what society is going to look like um, 10, 20 years in the future with any kind of accuracy. 
basically it's overly simplistic to have the math problem where Sally gives Freddy three apples because there's always something else happening in the, in the fringes, so to speak. And that's, that's kind of what we're dealing with today. Speaking of, speaking of fringes, so bioengineering, genetic engineering, you've talked a lot about how humanity needs to start dealing with and grappling with these challenges yeah. and these thoughts now. Where do you stand today and where does it stand today? So I think what happened with Hei Zhongkui, the uh, Chinese scientist who um, created the first genetically um, moderated or engineered human beings and brought them through full gestation so that now we have a pair of twin girls who have been intentionally genetically modified as embryos. I think that's the perfect case study of why we need to get out in front of this rather than constantly reacting to it. Now, there's been a lot of work, uh, including my own work, trying to make suggestions of how to get out in front of this. But we are stuck in a, in a, in a tough situation. So here's, here's the way I, I look at it. What happened in Dr. Hayes' case is we are now at the point where, where we have the technology to be able to genetically manipulate human embryos. Uh, we can, um, using um, CRISPR-Cas9, we can you know, alter genes or, or, or splice in genes probably in a way that will result in a living human being at the end. Um, but we really have, first of all, no idea what the long-term deficits of that are. Uh, second of all, we haven't worked out the question of what we owe to that generation in terms of our intervention in their actual physiology and our manipulation of the plasms of their life. What is an appropriate and inappropriate manipulation? Um, is it only okay to do it for health? Is it okay to do it for um, traits that are on the margins of health that, is, that may enhance their life? in a way, giving them athletic ability, for example, or musical ability, if that ever becomes possible. And what about just desirable traits? I want my child to you know, be 6'5", because I think tall people do better in life, or whatever it might be. In that spectrum and continuum of manipulation, we still have not reached a consensus. And, and not only have we, haven't we reached a consensus, there's enormous disagreement about what we should do there. So there's a health problem. We don't know what the long-term impact is. There's a um, morality of intervention problem. We don't know where to draw the line between what is an appropriate or an inappropriate um, intervention. There is a who gets to do this problem. Is this a technology should, that should end up being in every major hospital in the United States? And you know, you go into the equivalent of genes are us and you buy the gene palette that you want in your kid and you design your children? These are all questions we've been asking now for decades. Um, these kinds of questions of designer children, books about designer children were written in the 90s, if not before. And by the way, science fiction has dealt with this since I was a kid. So it's difficult to get the ethics in front of the technology. The way we often do it is we we use the technology, we have some disaster, and then we start talking about ethics in a serious way. Well, Dr. Hay was the canary in the coal mine. He ignored all the ethical structures in place and he just went and did this. Now there's some questions about whether these children are healthy and, and normal genetically. Um, I don't know what the res result of that will be. But it clearly was a violation of the collective attempt to try to create a technology of enormous power that will have a global implication and that we're trying to think about as a global scientific community. And that's why, astonishingly to me, who's been watching this for many, many years, the most interesting thing about this case was China's reaction. Because in the past, China has been the, the, um, the cowboy in these kinds of technologies, that is, they have um, been less uh, attentive to the world community's view of what the proper limits were, and they've done some things that other, uh, many other nations have said we're not ready to do yet, and they've tried to get out in front by doing um, edgy things, um, such as some of their work in uh, human-animal chimeras and things like that. 
in this case, they immediately sanctioned him. Um, and they were very um, responsive to the world community's concern about this. And they didn't consider this a case of China out in front of the world. They considered this a case of transgression. And the question is why? And I think the reason is because China, like everyone else, science has become such a global enterprise. And the scientific world community has gotten so small that if you're going to be a scientific rogue now, you're going to be outside the, the dialogue, the conversation, and the exchanges of technology that are going to move science forward on a global scale. And so China, that, that pressure is even forcing China to become much, a much more conventional member of the world scientific community and to try to conform to some of the ethical norms that the community is espousing. So there's a, just a really interesting set of dynamics happening right now in the world around these technologies. Uh, the, the goal here is not to stop these technologies or retard these technologies. They're powerful, important technologies. The goal is to do it in a way that safeguards people's lives and health and that uses the technologies in the most productive um, way that leads to the most human flourishing. So let's play devil's advocate. The U.S. or another country sends out an assassin. This person's not going to have any paperwork on them. They're going to be a dark agent, so to speak, with absolutely no traces of their country's allegiance. And that's not because the country doesn't totally believe in what they're doing. It's because they want total deniability. A, what are your thoughts on that in terms of China's reaction, just being able to have deniability? Because he had to have a ton of funding to be able to pull off what he pulled off. And then right. B, B, after that, get into this animal-human chimera deal that you brought up that we okay. can't avoid. Yeah. So, you know, sure, countries are going to do that. They always have and they always will. But don't underestimate the power of international consensus. Um, it, it has changed China's tactics fundamentally. Um, and it's... I am not, I will not be surprised to find countries, especially not so much China necessarily, but countries that are in the second or third tier of scientific achievement, trying to do some things that they hope will leapfrog them ahead, even if they tend to be against the, uh, or get them press, even if they tend to be against the global consensus, that's going to happen. But that happens with everything. I mean, there are going to be exceptions. There are going to be dark agents in science, as you put it. Um, but that's always been true. What we really need is the power, and what I think this case demonstrates is the power of um, global persuasion on trying to keep countries generally within some parameters of acceptable behavior. And that, uh, that international persuasion has power. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't going to be problems. It doesn't mean there aren't going to be exceptions, violations. Um, and that's, that's just going to be true. But that's still a much more desirable situation than every country doing whatever it wants without real um, um, constraints. Uh, I'll give you one other example that I think shows this. So my center at Emory, the Center for Ethics at Emory, is one of the world's leaders in neuroethics, the science of uh, the ethics of neuroscience. We published the main journal in that field, and um, I was one of the founders of the uh, Professional Association the International Neuroethics Society, and things like that. The one, the person who runs that program for us here at the center, Karen Rommelfanger, she is has been one of the people who has spearheaded bring together all the global, all the national brain initiatives. So there are seven majorly funded brain initiatives in the world. There's Obama's brain uh, initiative here in the US. There's one in Canada. The EU has a very large uh, brain matters initiative and Australia in the West, and then China, Japan, and South Korea in the East. So those are the seven major um, national initiatives equaling many tens of billions of dollars in government investment in brain science. So once a year, our center um, brings together those seven initiatives in South Korea to write a set of 
global ethical standards for neuroscience. Now, that was, would not have been achievable 10 years ago or 15 years ago. There is a recognition that I don't think was there before in neuroscience, in genetics, in these powerful technologies, that we need global standards um, to protect people from the power of these technologies. If we're going to use them for good, we have to have some set of ethical principles around them. Um, and I think it's happening on multiple levels. Is it possible, though? So there, there's a lot of people would argue that if it's treating some type of disease, genetic engineering, even if it's controversial, has at least the right to try its chops, so to speak. Yeah. But let's say you're going to have a daughter or a son and you find out, oh, wow, when Jimmy's seven, he's going to get cancer. It's mm -hmm. a 99% chance. Here's this genetic therapy that we can put him through. Mm -hmm. a law, I feel like for parents, laws aren't going to stop you. You break any law that's necessary, especially if it's something that's going to kill you. Sure. Is, it, is this kind of a slippery slope where no matter what we try to do, a black market will build. As the black market grows, people see, oh, I got uh, the Joneses kids. They're getting ahead. It's not really fair. I got to put Timmy and Johnny through this. Yeah. And it kind of becomes a keeping up with the Joneses where you have that slippery slope towards further and further. Not, not Brave New World genetic engineering because they were actually just moving people backwards, mm -hmm. but in general, self-enhancement to keep up with the Joneses. So, I mean, we have that problem already with certain pharmaceuticals where they're in the testing stage in the United States and we're not sure how well they work and whether they work um, or whether they have uh, side effects or toxicities that we need to know about. <clears throat> That's why we've put in place the um, drug testing procedures that we've put in place in the United States. Well, look, at Ritalin, look at Ritalin. 25% of college kids are on Ritalin or some right. other ADHD drug just to get yeah, an edge. We'll get there. We'll get there. I mean, to that exact kind of point. So we have this procedure. Now I'm not talking about accepted drugs. I'm talking about how we get a new drug into market. Ritalin has been around for over 80 years. Um, so now we have this new technology, genetic engineering. As far as we know, it's been used once on human beings by this doctor in China. Uh, we don't know what the health outcomes are. There's some indications that there may be some negative health outcomes. So it depends where in this timeline we're talking about. Um, if I were advising parents who had a child with a genetic disease or, or in utero or something um, that uh, potentially genetic engineering could help at this point, it would be absolutely irresponsible to try that on their child. We just, it's just premature. We just don't have the technology, technique, and talent yet to do this in a way that's safe and reliable. And then, as you say, there's going to be a timeline as it gets safer and more reliable, and we discover, I guarantee you, side effects and negative outcomes that we didn't predict at the beginning, and then we try to figure out, can we fix those? And along the way, there will come a point at which it seems to be safe enough and reliable enough that people might do exactly what you say. Try to go find it somewhere else. If it's still in a testing stage in the US, for example, that doesn't allow them access to it. They do that with new drugs. They do that with new, um, bio, with new medical technologies. That is going to happen. Um, that is a consequence of, the human, of human nature. Um, we can't really stop that. There's a difference between a problem that should stop a technology and a problem that you need to manage in order to use the technology. This is the kind of problem you need to manage in order to use this technology right. Because some people may misuse it is not a reason not to develop it and not to try to make it available to people. Um, so yes, I think you're right. I think that will happen. Part of what science education and medical education is about is to tell people here's why we don't think this is ready and here's why we don't think it makes sense for you to use this on your child yet we're just not ready that's not going to stop some people but ultimately there's not a lot we can do about that when do you think we start seeing decent scale either tests or straight up treatments happening not necessarily in the u.s because it'll happen slower because of the fda 
but in, in China in Singapore in other countries that might be willing to go faster. Yeah. Uh, I think it's going to happen within the next 10 years. I think one interesting um, question is going to be, so what actually does happen to these, this pair of twins that has now been born? Um, I guarantee you that if, you know, tragically, um, we see some very negative outcome. Uh, they die young, they develop some uh, childhood cancer or something like that. That is going to delay development of this or at least implementation of this. Um, it is a really problematic technology to test in the sense that you know, I used to say back in the old days when I talked about this, I, I used to say, I don't think it's unethical to use genetic manipulation to try to cure disease in a human being. My question is, how do you do it ethically the first 25 times? And I still think that that's true. That is, before we know what the, uh, I don't care how much animal testing you do, we've seen over and over and over and over again that the human response to Drugs and, and biotechnology is often different than that uh, when we do it in animal testing. So the big ethical hurdle is how do you do it the first couple dozen times when you don't really know what the outcome is going to be and when you may be causing more harm? Because this isn't just like taking a drug where you can take it, you know, and when we do phase one testing, we start people off on micro doses and we slowly increase the doses hoping to stop before anyone has a toxic reaction if in fact the drug has toxicity, right? You can't scale this up. This is a binary technology. You either do the, the genetic intervention or you don't. And that makes it much more difficult ethically to justify and um, figure out how to test it because you are clearly putting this embryo in a situation where if this technology has negative outcomes, they're gonna experience them. So all of that is a deep and profound challenge to us in developing this technology. Um, I think you're exactly right. I think what will happen is countries that are a little less concerned about those things, that have less of a um, system that strongly safeguards against those things are gonna do it first, and we'll see. We may see some tragic outcomes. Do you think we'll see more progress initially with in vitro or utero babies or with actual living humans, i.e., hey, you're on death row. You want to try out this treatment that could get you off and yada, yada, or you're dying of cancer already. Here's your shot. Well, I think actually it's neither of those. I think what's going to happen is gene therapy is going to be the first place where People who are, you know, competent adults who can make decisions who have genetic diseases or diseases that may be susceptible to a genetic manipulation will get some kind of gene therapy. This was the, this was the um, hope 20 years ago. I was at the University of Pennsylvania and they started the Institute for Human Gene Therapy then because in the 90s they thought gene therapy is just around the corner and, you know, within 15 years we're going to be injecting viral vectors into people all over the place that'll deliver genes to, you know, to the pancreas to reactivate, you know, um, cells to produce insulin. And there was this dream of adult somatic uh, gene therapy that got dashed because even though it's a beautiful and simple concept conceptually, the human body once again frustrated our best intentions and gene therapy is much more complicated and much more difficult than it seemed at first, which by the way, I think um, genetic engineering of embryos will turn out to be as well. Um, and so uh, that's where I think we're going to start making progress. And when we get re the way, the way I think it should go in a sense is once we get very good at understanding how to, um, uh, engage in various kinds of gene manipulation in consenting adult people and the technology becomes much more sophisticated and our knowledge becomes much deeper, um, then we'll turn to embryos. That's how it should happen, I think. 
Is it going to happen that way? I doubt it. I think there are going to be these rogue nations that are going to be trying these embryonic interventions before they're really technologically and ethically justifiable. In a lot of ways, it mirrors the AI race because it is a, almost a winner-take-all type scenario where there are risks, yes, but they're not as large to the individual as they are to the collective, and the rewards are massive. Exactly. And, you know, whenever you have risks to collective rather than individuals, it's hard to regulate that in a way that's meaningful. Um, so AI is actually a very good example. You know, this is, this may very well be an example of. It's biological AI versus artificial AI. Yeah. And AI itself, I mean, um, artificial AI may be a case of all of us in racing cars heading for the cliff and we're much more interested in seeing who can get there first than recognizing that once we get there, we're all going off the edge. Yeah, life's a race, right? We want to get to the end first. Talk yeah. about talk about black swan events. Are, are you worried with genetic engineering? I know that I personally have some... I think one of the biggest things that people don't realize is we don't know what we don't know. Yeah. And we don't know what we don't know until we realize we don't know it. And too, oftentimes that's too late. Yeah, and it will happen. I mean, there's not even maybe it'll happen. It's a question of when, not if. This is a very sophisticated system, our genetic system, the human and animal genetic system. It is in some ways one of the most complex things we know about in the universe. Um, maybe only the human brain is more complex with its trillions of connections, but we're talking about a human genome with tens of thousands of genes interacting with um, you know, uh, uh, epigenetic processes that turn genes on and off with environmental um, inputs that turn genes on and off. This is an extraordinarily complex system. I mean, look at the extraordinarily complex beings that it creates. And so when we manipulate it, at this point, we're manipulating it in a very crude way. The greatest scientists in the world admit that that we're still, we're still bumbling and we're still, um, you know, we're still at a very, very early stage of understanding it, how to manipulate the system and what the um, ripple effects are of intervening in one particular part of the system. So um, what's going to happen undoubtedly is there are going to be unexpected consequences. There are going to be, um, uh, mistakes, there are going to be um, uh, positive and negative outcomes that are completely unanticipated. But that's the way it always is with sophisticated technologies. There's no example where that's not true. And by the way, one other thing, here's another thing that has always fascinated me from the beginning as a sociologist. Every technology we create creates both positive outcomes and then challenges that were some anticipated most unanticipated. So we create the car, the automobile, and nobody predicted that the automobile would destroy the inner city. But that's what happened because inner cities were um, in the early 20th century, late 19th century were the um, labor markets. That's where manufacturing happened. It's where the labor forces were. Then all of a sudden, the car allowed people to take manufacturing out of the city and put it on cheaper land in the rural, suburban or rural areas, because now workers could drive there and drive back. They could get there. And what that ended up doing was it, it made the inner city bereft. As all the manufacturing left, Nobody knew what to do with the inner cities. And then we get the mid 20th century decline of the inner cities. We get crime. We get all of these things happening in the inner city until the inner city in the late 20th century is reinvented as a headquarters for um, art and culture and, and headquarters of organizations and things like that. But if you talk to you know, Henry Ford or someone else in the early 20th century, there was absolutely no way to predict that this would be the outcome of that technology. Look at personal computers and now, you know, uh, uh, PDAs and other things, and look at all of the kinds of collateral um, challenges as well as benefits they brought. 
many of them unpredictable by our most brilliant minds. So technologies always end up creating challenges that we don't predict as well as benefits that we don't predict. And as you move down the line, they can, they can alter societies in ways that people never even imagine. You know, my daughter went to George Washington University and when you walk in Washington DC around that campus, as you reach every corner on the sidewalk is spray painted, look up. Because so many students were walking around with their faces in their cell phones that they were stepping off of curves and getting hit by cars. Who could have ever predicted that outcome of a really good cell phone, right? So, I mean, there are all of these kinds of, of collateral um, sort of ripples that these technologies create that we can't even begin to anticipate, I think, at this point. And to piggyback off the car example, if we want to one-up it, before that, everyone got around via horses and the world was going to go to hell via climate change from the, the poop variety. Right. Cities, were, cities were terrible. Cars saved us from that only to later bring us back to climate change. But exactly, it is very interesting how that happens. Is this different, though, because of the exponential nature of genetic technologies, of biotech, the fact sure. that one individual can create a plague, one company can create a cure that turns into a crushing disease? No question. I mean, the power of these technologies is it's part a, it's of- It's a nuke in the hands of anyone. Exactly right. I mean, the power, the, and that is the scare. As, as I've often said, when I talk to lay groups and business groups who don't, for whom this isn't their normal concern or, and, and they don't think about this too much, and, and they're often worried about what's happening in the laboratories of the universities. And I say, look, what's happening at MIT is not what you should be worried about. It's happening at Emory or other places. That's not what you should be worried about. There are all kinds of checks and balances at the major universities to try to make sure that we don't do anything really destructive or stupid. The problem is that a good graduate student in a basic lab can use CRISPR Cas9 to create a pathogen. I mean, the problem right now is these technologies are so powerful that you don't need to be MIT to create something really problematic, to create you know an environmental toxin uh, or to create a pathogen, and that really is where the danger lies. And as we move forward, that will become more and more true, both in terms of intentional and unintentional misuse of these technologies, both in terms of bioterrorism and in terms of bio accidents. Uh, and, and, uh, Which worries you more and why? People that have good intentions or those that have bad? <clears throat> um, I think bioterrorism worries me more because um, the bioterrorists will release these kinds of things with, with forethought about how to make them as undetectable or at least as uh, to delay detection to the degree possible, while in accidents, presumably, the person who initiates the accident is equally invested in trying to fix it. So they're not about trying to hide it um, uh, or put, do it in as nefarious a way as possible. Uh, that being said, I think they're both really worrisome. Um, and, uh, you know, kids in middle school biology classes today are doing things that the greatest scientists in the world couldn't do 20 years ago. I mean, the science is progressing at an incredibly rapid clip, and the power of it is going to be so widespread that the reason that accidents are as worrisome as bioterrorism is that the N of bioterrorism is small, right? So there will be some finite number of groups trying to hurt you, but the N of accidents is incredibly large. There will be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people tinkering with this stuff in college laboratories and even high school laboratories and in their home labs. And um, so the potential for an accident is greater just in terms of numbers. And the upside, the funding, the number of groups. How do you think about that? Silicon Valley's had the move fast and break things mantra. They've started to move away from that since they've realized they started to break things. Yeah. But in terms of biotech, that's 
even more terrifying because you're not messing with someone's happiness. Yeah. You're messing with someone's everything. Right. And I think the good news there, at least in my experience, and I've been around this now for 40 years and talking to groups for 40 years, is that everyone gets that. I think the, the, the conceit of Silicon Valley was breaking things isn't going to really hurt too much. It'll cause some local damage and then we can fix that. I think people with biotech recognize that there's a chance here to really cause major destruction. Um, so at least the responsible biotech and the biotech companies really have an eye on safety, really have a worry about causing an accident because nothing's going to destroy a biotech company right now faster than having a technology that goes out of control and causes damage um, and is then credited to that company. So yeah, that is that mean that we don't have to worry about this? No, we have to worry about this because they're going to be irresponsible companies. They're going to be, you know, ignorant uh, groups and individuals who um, do things that a more sophisticated person would recognize could have a, a negative outcome, but they're not, they don't realize it. Yeah, all of that has the potential to happen. How do we avoid having the same problems with the pharma industry and healthcare when it comes to biotech, the million dollar treatments, which really don't need to cost more than a few pennies, et cetera? Well, you know, the problem with the cost of pharma is not a pharma problem. It's a government and regulatory problem. So the drugs that cost, there are drugs that cost 10, 20, 30, even 100 times more in the United States than they do in India or Europe because they won't tolerate it. So it, part of this is not just um, intrinsic to pharma. It is intrinsic to the idea of any company that we will we'll charge what the market will bear. And the United States has not had the will, the political will, to pass regulations that um, control what the market will bear around pharma costs. Other countries have. So we're the cash cow for pharma. We pay more for drugs than any other country on earth. So it's a complicated technology. I mean, it's a complicated question that way of how we're going to control costs. That being said, um, I don't think there's much doubt about the fact that like so many other technologies, when genetic technologies first begin to really hit the market, it's going to be the wealthy that can afford them. And then, like almost everything else, over time, with a little bit of luck, um, they'll get more and more affordable as they get more and more routine, um, and the prices will come down. But that's how new technologies tend to, that's the dynamics of new technologies. Will the U.S.'s Judeo-Christian morals and values hold them back in biotech? I feel like it already kind of is. So, yes and no. I mean, there are certain areas in biotech where those standards and beliefs are much more um, applicable and have a much, a much greater power than other places. So industrial uses of... Um, of genetically engineered um, microorganisms where you know, th there are very few uh, Judeo-Christian principles that anyone cares about in terms of creating those kinds of microorganisms and we're just along with everyone else. The, all, the place where that kicks in is when we talk about, primarily, is when we talk about manipulating human life. Um, will it hold us back? Um, perhaps, but perhaps appropriately also. Um, we don't want to be cavalier about those things. There's a tendency to be cavalier as we look at, as we, we sort of bypass the human condition and look right to the science. Um, and we do that a lot, um, even in the way we think. I've often criticized conversations about genetic engineering because the conversations usually by men seem to go something like this we're going to genetically engineer this embryo and then we're going to stick it in a woman for nine months and then look at what comes out the other end and that sort of middle that middle piece of a human woman gestating a, uh, another living human being in her womb for nine months and 
all of that's bypassed in one phrase as if that's just sort of the production line. And so there, there really is a way in which science ends up or, or some kinds of discussions of science ends up taking the human being completely out of the equation in a real sense. I mean, there, in a vague sense, there may be something we're talking about we're trying to help people and make people healthier and, and that excuse becomes the excuse for almost any activity. Um, but we need a more robust and powerful sense of the role of the human being in the scientific process. About uh, five years ago, I put together a global conference called Beings, Biotechnology and the Ethical Imagination, a global summit. Uh, we had it here in Atlanta. We brought in you know, thinkers from Steve Pinker to Margaret Atwood came and, and spoke and George Church was there. I mean, a lot of people from a whole spectrum of thought around issues around science. And we published in Nature Biotechnology a set of ethical principles um, that we thought should guide the way we think about all of the issues you're asking me about. And one of the key things about that set of principles that we wrote was how important it was never to lose sight of the human being in the science. Um, never to lose sight of the fact that you are involving real people with real lives and real concerns in the process of scientific testing and in the process of, um, of uh, doing your science like Dr. Hay probably and almost certainly did in his experiment with the twins. Who are the, Who is their mother and what is the relationship of that mother to those children and did she really understand what she was getting herself into? We, we just don't know. Another thing, by the way, that we put into that set of principles that I think is really important and that we just completely bypass in our science generally is these technologies that we are creating are going to have impact on communities and societies, not just individuals. They're going to change the way we reproduce. They're going to change the nature of genetic disease. They're going to change the nature of inheritance, right? I mean, so right now I got 100% of my genes from my mother and my father, but 30 years from now, I may get 70% of my genes from my mother and father, and 30% of my genes are spliced in or manipulated through genetic engineering in order to make me healthier or whatever the excuse is. So we're changing the very nature someday of genetic inheritance. All of these things have implications for the human condition. So one of the things we put into our set of principles is that this has to be a conversation not just among scientists and not even just among scientists and bioethicists like me, but we have to bring all the stakeholders into this from you know, uh, countries that right now don't have the technology but will still be impacted to it, to indigenous people, to, I mean, this is a human global conversation. This is not something that should just stay in the scientific community with with those of us who sort of revolve around the scientific community like me, but it needs to be a conversation that the human community has because it's going to so profoundly impact them. Is a big part of the problem that today's technologists have become much less human and animal. You seem to see that this is one of my theories is you see people and they, they seem to think that a, it'll be very easy to model a human and a human brain because Obviously, there's things happening, and there's electrical impulses, and we're going to be able to eventually, when we have enough power, make all of this work because it has to work like that. I, I would think and argue that a big part of the reason we have such an issue with climate change, we have such an issue with creating technology that's not human, is that the people that are creating it are no longer in the real world. They're no longer among people, so they can think about people as numbers and inputs rather than something more than numbers and inputs. I think that's exactly right. And I, and I think that the kind of um, dissociation of our science from the real lived experience of human beings um, is, is very problematic. Look, one of the things we see over and over again is whatever the latest scientific paradigm is or set of ideas or latest technologies are, we think that accurately reflects the way human beings work, right? In a 
in, in a Cartesian mechanical world, human body was like a mechanism. It was like a, you know, it was like a watch. And then all of the human processes, the scientists of the time were trying to understand in simple mechanical terms. And then as you move down the line, each new sort of breakthrough of science in general is then applied to the human body. I remember a whole set of conversations probably in the 70s, maybe early 80s, around the brain as hologram, because we had just basically discovered holograms. And look, a hologram is like a full picture of you know each piece of which contains the whole that must be how the brain th images things how we think about things so all these books that came about it came out about the brain as hologram and this happens over and over again it reminds so right me now, oh, go ahead so i'm just the, the the end of that sent the end of that thought is so right now we're in a particular paradigm with big data and ai and algorithms and all of that so the brain must look like that and the body must work that way because that's where we are in our thinking. And just like every other example, it'll turn out to be incomplete. It'll turn out to be just one piece of this. And when you go too far with those analogies and you think they reflect reality rather than reflecting our best thinking right now that's going to change 10 years from now, um, you can cause a lot of damage when you start applying them to real human beings. And I can give you example after example of how that happened historically. Oh, absolutely. It reminds me of a, a strange metaphor for religion. As you watch the evolution of religion through humanity's history, every, subse every sub subsequent jump in technology and understanding led to a little less of the mystery surrounding the world, which led to a changing of the gods in terms of what the gods could do, because the gods always solved the mysteries that humanity couldn't quite patched together and it's kind of the flip side of the same coin once you see something you see it for everything and when you can't see something you see it as everything it's a it's an interesting little interesting little tidbit so i wanted to i wanted to transition this a little bit mm -hmm. so in terms of the 21st century which will be more dominant and important ai or biological engineering i actually think um there's going to eventually probably not in 10 years or 20 years but 50 or 60 perhaps going to be a convergence of those two things we are already you know we're already putting ai technology into our bodies um through prosthetics um there are now prosthetic limbs that have ai components to them to help um you know a human prosthetic arm do delicate things so I'm not sure that they're going to remain as separate as we think of them as right now. Um, I think the bigger threat comes from AI in terms of the fact that, you know, biological manipulations will always be under our control to some degree, while AI may get out of our control. Um, Even with gene drives? I'm sorry, say that again? Even with gene drives? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are scenarios we can imagine where where it does get out of our control. But I think in terms of the threat, um, I see a greater threat in AI, and I see it coming probably more inevitably and sooner. You see a lot of books right now about super intelligence. Um, James Burnett's The Final Invention that says we basically are creating the invention that will replace us and um, you know make human beings irrelevant or Nick Bostrom's work. I mean, all of those suggest that it isn't that far in the future where AI's capabilities to some degree, I mean, I think this personally, I think there's problems with this, but a lot of people are writing about how these technologies, once AI's um, rational intelligence exceeds our own in so many areas um, that will render the human in a secondary or irrelevant place. So that's where I think the greater threat is, or at least the greater danger um, I think it's going to be a while before biology gets to that uh, point. Um, and so to answer the question you asked me, I see AI as the bigger uh, challenge for the nature of human life than I do the biological sciences. What are your thoughts on cloning and where we're headed? Very relevant, but slightly different. So I've never had the um, moral problem with cloning that some of my colleagues have had. Um, I think 
and it depends what you, what you're asking me here. If you're talking about cloning human beings, talking about using cloning technologies um, in industry or in animals or in pharma. I mean, cloning can be used in a lot of different realms. So um, it's also ethically problematic. So, for example, one of the goals in pharma is to create an animal that can express the molecule, the drug molecule you're trying to produce in its blood or its milk, and then clone thousands of those animals, and then you can just, um, you know, manufacture your drug by extracting milk or blood and then, you know, um, filtering it for your molecule. And so we're talking about creating living manufacturing plants. Um, and that is, you know, that, that depends on cloning technology. So that's an interesting set of ethical questions about how we treat animals. And if um, that was the subject of my TED talk, if you go back and look at the TED talk I did about 10 years ago now, it was all about that question early, much earlier in, in the history of that. How are we gonna treat animal bodies and to what degree are we going to um, use animal bodies simply as um, objects of our genetic manipulation in order to solve uh, human needs and problems and what do we owe to animals that way if you're talking about human cloning you're, you're talking about a much different question and i think human cloning comes after genetic engineering in the sequence of of moral acceptability that is what about an inevitable timeline yeah, so th there's n there, there are very few ethically compelling reasons to clone. I can think of a few, but they're, 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 they come much later than the ethically, uh, the ethically compelling reasons to use genetic engineering, right? So genetic engineering presumably will be able to be used to cure really bad genetic diseases and embryos and, um, and fetuses in utero and things like that that is a much more morally compelling argument to intervene than anything you can think of as a reason to argue for cloning. Um, and for that reason, I think genetic engineering is prior. I think we will use it first. Um, but, one, but what's gonna happen, I predict, is that at some point, not too long after that, these kinds of genetic manipulations will become relatively routine. And once genetic manipulation becomes routine, then our thinking about it changes. One of the things you see over and over again is that people are scared of technologies when they first emerge, and then they become much more comfortable with them as they become routine, and that broadens the acceptability of collateral technologies. And so once genetic engineering becomes kind of routine and used uh, successfully, uh, if it does, to intervene in genetic diseases and other kinds of problems and spina bifida and who knows what, then cloning is going to become to seem a lot less exotic, a lot less um, extreme, and cloning may come in on the heels of that as um, justifiable in, in certain circumstances. Um, so, I mean, that's how I think it will go. Yeah, it's the progression. Google can track a little bit more about you every day because you don't notice the slippery slope of your hair growing. Exactly. I want one more question before we jump into the listener only uh, or the patron only bonus questions. And that's if and when humanity will diverge into multiple species. Yeah. Oh, that's the question. So like what you just said about Google, it's not going to happen one day. It'll be a process. Um, And I guarantee you, no matter, we could get the greatest minds in the room to talk about how that's going to happen and the circumstances under which it'll happen. And then when it actually happens, it's not going to look like any of those, right? The example I like to give is there were probably hundreds, if not thousands of um, short stories, books, science fiction books, and other things written before the before late 60s about going to the moon the first time. Literally thousands. Not a single one got it right, right? Not a single one thought of 
an arms race between, I mean, almost all of them were some rogue scientist in his backyard creating a rocket that went to the moon. None of them thought of the collective activity of a nation because of a political rivalry with another nation to be the first ones on the moon. And certainly none of them thought that after that, there'd be another 40 year gap before we did it again or more. I mean, so that's what, I, that's what I was trying to say about Kurzweil at the beginning too. The way human dynamics actually happen is almost always different than how we imagine it's gonna happen. That being said, I do think at some point we'll become genetically sophisticated enough that we will begin to um, manipulate human beings um, in ways where they will diverge into what you're calling different species. Uh, that will take a lot longer to actually think of speciesation about it, but certainly so that people be, you know, uh, get um, separated into kind of human breeds. And is it going to happen for pragmatic reasons? That is, are we going to say, we finally got to the point where we want to colonize Mars? Uh, wouldn't it be um, advantageous to see if we can make the human body more oxygen efficient? Uh, so let's go look at the um, oxygenation genes of the mountain yak, which is really, really good at uh, process, you know, at, at, at efficient use of oxygen in the body and put that into human beings. And, you know, are we going to start designing human beings for specific tasks and create subbreeds that are designed for those tasks? Or is it going to be more of an evolutionary thing as we begin, you know, more like the Gattaca movie, where we begin to manipulate human beings to make them better, whatever that means, and more efficient and less disease prone. And then we end up with different strains or, or the elite and the unmanipulated. Uh, we, kind of, we kind of already see it with the elite and the unmanipulated. The, the poorest of the poor have a 10 year, in the US, the poor have a 10 year shorter lifespan than the rich. We're right. already, now then tech, technology, education, we're kind of already seeing that. Imagine if you take something that improves your intelligence. Well, suddenly if you're 50, 100 IQ points higher, you're not going to be interested in anyone else other than the elite of the elite. You kind of start only breeding together. Right. I think that that is true. I mean, the difference is, of course, that if you pull a poor person out of their poor environment and you put them in an elite environment, um, our belief right now in general is that they are going to grow up to be equal to the elites that they were. Um, so it isn't intrinsic, it's environmental. And in this case you're asking about, we're talking about intrinsic differences and through genetic manipulation. And, um, you know, that's, uh, that's almost certainly going to happen. Um, but as I say, it's really hard to know right now exactly how. Let's say that, for example, genetic manipulation gets very sophisticated and you are the dictator of a totalitarian regime. And you say to your top scientists, scientists, here's what I want. I want an army of really sort of big, strong soldiers um, who have, um, you know, uh, very little sense of um, conscience. Now, are we going to be able to manipulate that genetically? I have no idea, but you can begin to see that when you talk about this kind of differentiation genetically, it can be done for a lot of different kinds of reasons. I would argue we could probably do the conscious one pretty easily. Cause if you look, we've had a couple of people on the program now and you find very, very similar profiles and uh, nutrient and metal profiles in people that are in prison and people that aren't in prison. Mm -hmm. I.e., something in their brain chemistry going wrong, causing them to have much higher likelihoods. It's um yeah, it's a it's a scary future yeah. we're headed towards, but it's also an incredibly promising one. Right, it's true of violent people in prison, uh, people who are convicted of violent crimes. That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to to be violent, you kind of have to lean at least a little that way. Let's yeah. jump into the bonus patron only questions, okay. guys. If you haven't become a patron, five dollars or more a month if you support us. We have bonus questions with all of our awesome guests. And this is 100% a ploy to try to make this more sustainable because we're trying to make this into something that you guys can enjoy and benefit from more than a, a cup of Starbucks or two a month. If it is, consider supporting us, disruptors.fm slash Patreon. Now let's jump to it. I got two last questions for you. When can I glow? 
you could glow tomorrow, not you, but your child could glow tomorrow. I mean, maybe you also, I don't know. But certainly, we have the technical ability to genetically intervene in an embryo and take green fluorescent proteins um, and, and genetically engineer them into a human being the way we haven't, we've already done it in monkeys. Um, so technically, you could have a child tomorrow morning um, that uh, had green fluorescent protein or one of the other um, fluorescent um, molecules coursing through its cells. Um, and um, the question of whether that's an even remotely ethical thing to do is different than the question of whether we could do it tomorrow, which we really have the technology to be able to do. And if you do it, don't tell your wife. Just pretend like it's an accident of nature, because otherwise <laughs> you're in for an accident of nature, so to speak. This has been a this has been a fun one, Paul. Before you tell people where to find you and a little more about your work, if you had to leave people with one thing, a quote, a call to action, it can be anything. What would it be and why? There is no action that human beings do that isn't driven by our values. Even if we think we're doing something for pragmatic reasons, um, I have a I have a kind of unique definition of ethics. Um, because I'm an unusual ethicist in that I'm a, as a social scientist and not a philosopher or a theologian, or, which most ethicists are. And my definition of ethics is simply how we express our values in the world and how we determine and assess our relationships based on those values. And so I believe every act that we do, from the most trivial to the most complex, is in some way a reflection of the values that we hold. And so I think it's very important that we not be unconscious um, about what the values are that we are reflecting. And by that, I mean, we need to deep dive into our behavior. If we eat meat, for example, we really need to understand where that meat comes from, the impact it has on the world, uh, what kinds of meat we buy, um, whether you know, it's, it's sustainable, free range, those kinds of things are powerful, they have powerful ripples um, moving outwards from ourselves. So my one, my one message out to the world is we don't live in a value-free world and you don't live a value-free life. And I think it's our responsibility as human beings in a time where our ability and our power to change the world, to change human beings, to change the environment is so powerful that we have to have a really strong value set that drives the decisions that we make. And the ones that we don't, because every action is also a decision. I would have one caveat I want to ask or play devil's advocate, though. Sure. When people hear something like that, how do you avoid becoming depressed? Because, well, shit, the climate's going to hell and we're killing all of these animals. And damn it, Starbucks didn't recycle the cup or let me use it as a refill. So it's going to a freaking landfill. How do you think about all of these things? Because when people, it's the, it's the slippery slope of, OCD, the more obsessed you become with something, the less happy and the less able you are to focus on solutions. So maybe, maybe you are, um, maybe you decide to go vegetarian, but maybe you don't. And instead you're focusing on creating a clean meat startup, but because of the less stress you have, it lets you put more into it. How do you yeah. think about that stuff? So there are a few different, there are a few bits of advice that I like to think about around those things. Number one, we are each finite human beings. There's only so much I can do. It is much better to pick one or two or a couple of places that you want to put your energy. None of us, there are, you know, there are thousands and thousands of human challenges and none of us can cope with all of them. So put your energy somewhere. Um, I think it's much better to make a big difference somewhere than you know, trivial differences in a lot of different places. I think that's how you change the world. Don't underestimate the power of one person to help um, create change in, in other people. And then the third thing is take a long view. Yeah, what gets people depressed is, is the short view. Um, human beings have been around, you know, for a short time on this planet, but that short time has still been, you know, 150,000 years or so. Um, people get depressed about what's going to happen 10 years from now or 20 years from now. If we're still around, 30, 50, 100, 500 years from now, things are going to look so different that we can't even imagine them now. And we're making a lot of progress. Um, when I was growing up, rivers were catching on fire. 
they were so polluted. The Clean Air and Clean Water Act have, has cleaned a lot of that up. People laughed at the idea of alternative energy. It was some like left-wing socialist pipe dream. Now we have you know um, solar power and wind power all over the place. Um, we have passed laws about uh, great ape rights. Um, here at Emory, we have Yerkes Primate Center, and Yerkes Primate Center has stopped all experimentation on chimpanzees. So there are a lot, and I could give many other examples, there are lots of areas of progress. We can change the world. Um, and the one thing that will stop us from changing it is despair. So I find despair to be a kind of moral cop-out rather than uh, a you know, reasonable reaction to the world. It keeps us from doing the things we need to do to try to help change. Depression doesn't help anybody. Help yourself and then help the world. I like it. Where is the best place for people to find you, Paul? Well, I'm at the Center for Ethics at Emory University. You put that in Google, you'll find me in a second, ethics.emory.edu. We have a, a great um, website uh, that you can look at. If you Google me on um, like Google videos, you'll see many of, you'll see my TED Talks, got a couple of TED Talks up. I've got um, other, I got a wonderful set of videos where I talk from a technological ethical response to the superhero movies and other movies that have a technological component to them. So uh, you can find my center and you can find me through a simple search, which is probably the easiest way. And uh, I think uh, I would love to hear from any of your listeners who want to get in touch with us at the center. Um, we have wonderful programs if you're in the Atlanta region, and I look forward to hearing from your listeners. And no, we can't do any intelligence updates on you guys if you're looking for the hookups. We're not quite there yet. Thanks for coming today, Paul. Sure, my pleasure. This has been fun, guys. If you've enjoyed it, disruptors.fm. And if you go to disruptors.fm slash iTunes, leave us a review. Help us get more incredible guests and to grow the audience so we can make this into something that really makes an impact on the world. Cheers. Awesome. That was good.